This is the ninth episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Sean. And, this is- and I'm Evan. And um, we talk about the latest news in the cryptocurrency space relating to Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, altcoins like Litecoin, Darkcoin. There's hundreds of of them at this point. And we just cover the recent news in this space to help our viewers get a better grasp on what's happening in the industry. You know, what coins are up, what coins are down, um, how, how Bitcoin, the main one, is doing in consumer adoption and regulations and stuff like that. So... Um, let's start with our first topic today, which is going to focus on Overstock, Overstock.com, which is the one of the first major retailers to start accepting Bitcoin for products uh, on their website. And um, they are pushing forward to new frontiers um, in the in the Bitcoin uh, economy. So what what are some of these new developments that they're going to start implementing for Overstock Bitcoin payments? Okay, so we've got two pretty exciting news stories coming from Overstock. The first one, uh, Patrick Byrne did an interview uh, on RT with uh, Kate Long on the show she does on RT. And they were talking about Bitcoin, and he he uh, dropped the news that they would be, that within four to six weeks, they would be expanding their Bitcoin acceptance to the entire world. Currently, ever since they started accepting Bitcoin in January, at the beginning of 2014, it's been U.S. only. So now, um, everywhere that has access to Overstock.com can now will be able to pay for their goods in Bitcoin within four to six weeks. Uh, that's that's a pretty big deal. Just because of the sheer size of Overstock, it's a direct competitor with Amazon. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Yeah, it's it's a 1.5 billion dollar business, um, according to Patrick Byrne. That's you know that's a pretty sig- substantial, uh, significantly sized company. Yeah. Um, Byrne in this interview said that before his company started accepting Bitcoin, the largest company was worth a million dollars. So Overstock has definitely brought some, you know, big business into the Bitcoin economy. And Bitcoin, U.S. Bitcoin sales alone makes up a quarter of a percent of Overstock's total revenues. Now, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot. um, But when we're talking about $1.5 billion, almost 1% of the, or a fourth of a percent of that is in... Um, yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin sales. Yeah, it's a pretty good bit of money, and once that it's once that is expanded to the whole world, you know, it's going to be even more. Yeah. So, that's the first story. Do you have anything to say about it before I move on to the next one? Well, I think that's great. Um, you know, Overstock is one of the um, greatest, or and and their CEO Patrick Byrne as well. You know, one of the greatest supporters of Bitcoin and and promoting its acceptance and adoption. And, you know, Overstock is really going the whole mile right here by, you know, opening up this payment option to the entire world, which, you know, given Bitcoin's decentralized nature, it kind of should have been that way from the beginning. But it's tough to implement, you know, that kind of stuff for the whole world when there's all kinds of legal issues that you have to wade through, especially for a big corporation like Overstock. So it's great that they're going on to uh, the world. Yeah, and I think it's really awesome that it's actually, you know, Patrick Byrne. Because, you know, he's not, he's not one of these people who's jumping on the bandwagon. Like, he was, you know, a, a pioneer. Like, he was yeah. one, of, one of the first major businesses to accept Bitcoin. And he did it because of his beliefs. Like, not, not because, uh, obviously he did it for profit motive because he expects to make, to become super rich off of it in the future. But in, in his interview with Kate Long on RT, he said that he wanted Overstock to accept Bitcoin just because he holds an anti-authoritarian ideology. So, you know, this this is a guy who has, you know, long-term visions for Bitcoins, not just short-term profits in mind. So, I think it's I think if any company is going to be the first global comp- like major global company to accept Bitcoin, Overstock was probably the best company that could have done it. Because 
simply because Patrick Byrne is so ide- ideologically invested in it, he's definitely going to make sure that um, that Bitcoin is easy to use for his company. Yeah. And so that's, you know, they're expanding acceptance to the whole world. So that's kind of the external aspect that they're supporting Bitcoin with. Um, but internally, inside the company as well, they're actually expanding Bitcoin use in terms of, you know, just payments to employees. And so what are what are some developments on how they're going to, you know, promote that? Right. In a recent interview with Mashable, um, an Overstock representative by the name of Judd uh, Bagley, I think that's how you pronounce his name, he revealed that um, Overstock is working on a plan to offer annual bonuses in Bitcoin. And um, I think he said that, they're, that, that that program is going to be up and running by the end of the year, hopefully. And they're actually, the company is actually, going, is actually going to be trying to encourage their employees to pick the Bitcoin bonus over the fiat bonus hmm. because they're going to be offering it at a premium. You'll be if you pick Bitcoin, you'll actually get a bigger bonus than you would if you picked fiat. Wow. Yeah. And what's what's even bigger, the main news story is this they're gonna be paying bonuses, but um after Coindesk got a hold of this news story from Mashable, they reached out to this representative and asked for a comment. And he actually told Coindesk uh, this is a uh, direct quote, depending on how that works out in regards, in reference to the uh, bonuses, uh, depending on how it works out and is received, we will look at making regular payroll checks available in Bitcoin. Nice. So if this bonus program works out, they could, they could be uh, pursuing a program to pay wages and salaries completely in Bitcoin. Wow. Yeah, blazing and new paths right there. That's huge for acceptance because if you have a bunch of people who get paid in nothing but Bitcoin, um, obviously Overstock won't be able to do this single-handedly, but it's a huge first step. If enough people get paid solely in Bitcoin, then businesses will be forced just out of necessity to maintain you know, their profits, the same business. They'll have no choice but to accept Bitcoin as payment. And as a result of that, the people who are higher up the ladder who make producers goods and extract raw materials from the earth, they'll be able to, or they will have to accept Bitcoin as well. And what that'll do is um, companies uh, like merchants and retailers, they'll no longer have to cash out their Bitcoins for fiat because they can pay for overhead expenses in Bitcoin. Yep. So if, so once that happens, um, it's, really going to be like a huge historical achievement for Bitcoin um, because the value would finally be stabilized yeah. because you have these people who get paid a nothing but Bitcoin, so they buy everything in Bitcoin. They and pay then, for expenses in Bitcoin. You know. Yeah, and then, those, and then those Bitcoins that the businesses get, they stay Bitcoins. Like They don't convert them into dollars. It's so, an actual currency that's being exchanged yeah. between all these people. So... So, you know, like when, when a major company accepts Bitcoin, you know, usually we get this huge spike in sell volume because they're converting their revenues to fiat. That won't happen anymore, and that'll be huge for Bitcoin. Yeah, totally huge. You, you said it perfectly. Um, like once we have companies that operate, you know, at, entirely on this digital currency, pay employees in Bitcoin, uh, pay for overhead costs in Bitcoin, pay their suppliers in Bitcoin, um, like it, it'll be a huge uh, shift in the in the economy, um, at, it, something the world has never really seen before. You know, so, certainly, like people ha- would not have expected something like this to happen uh, like twenty or thirty years ago. Like uh, an entire business potentially running on a digital currency that was invented just five years ago. It's amazing. Yeah, and when that happens, hopefully it'll happen. So. Um, and when it ha- happens, you know, some of these crazy, like, visions that, you know, the super hardcore Bitcoin fanatics have of, like, it ending central banking, like, challenging government power, you know. Stopping wars from happening. Yeah. Could could actually come true, you know. 
if everybody yeah. used Bitcoin. That's the goal, right? I think that's the goal yeah. that that like so many people in this community have, and like this this amazing like you you utopic vision that we have. Um, that, Creating a peaceful and more prosperous society. I mean, like yeah, uh, you know, trying to eliminate corruption out of you know the halls of government by making it obsolete. Um, it, it's a vision that isn't going to happen on its own. So that's why like all these people are working, working toward it. Patrick Byrne is doing all kinds of great stuff to work towards that goal. And, you know, there's, there's a growing amount of small businesses as well that are operating, um, solely or at least mostly in Bitcoin. And, you know, Overstock is just blazing the path for big corporations to do the same. Yeah. And so, you know, this kind of this brings me to another topic that you you told me about it like early this morning. I don't know, you might have forgot about it. But um it in in terms of decentralized alternatives to government, we were talking about Ethereum. Yeah. And uh you sent me a link to this quote from uh Vitalik, is that how you say his name? The guy yeah, from Vitalik. Ethereum. Vitalik. Yeah, that's about right. And, and he he outlined his like like this like crazy vision for how ethereum could work uh-huh yeah it would it and would take the idea of decentralized currency and uh, applies it to an entire economy not just of people but like uh, autonomous organizations and machines who like basically make payments in vir in virtual currency automatically without any humans trying to um or humans having to control right it. like and like you know, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a huge step in that because, it, and you know, in my personal opinion, um, you know, the ether that serves is like the fuel. It's it's technically a cryptocurrency, um, but really, I don't I don't think if it if Ethereum ever gets off the ground and goes anywhere, I don't think the ether will actually be like a currency. It'll just be like um, a way to sign contracts and confirm transactions, um, and and Ethereum will operate on top. Of Bitcoin, with Bitcoin serving as you know the actual you know valuable currency, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of uh, similar to what uh, Gavin Andreessen had to say about his you know, uh, he called it Bitherium, and there's an article about it on CoinBrief if anybody wants to look it up. Um, but it's you know it's a really interesting way to envision a future society where everything is decentralized and um, autonomous, uh, like. Vitalik was talking about you, you wake up and you check your phone and you know seventeen dollars is automatically removed uh, from your from your account to pay to pay rent uh, and if you, if you don't pay rent like the lock signature on your doorknob automatically changes so like so so your key doesn't like it doesn't like confirm the transaction to unlock the door or whatever. And it's like a vision of a completely decentralized, trustless society. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and like if if your landlord like isn't keeping up the the his his end of the of the bargain or whatever, like if there's an agreement between the landlord and the government, the government can come in and just take the property automatically. No human has to flip the switch or anything. It just does it automatically because the the landlord wasn't paying the bills. And then you're if you're still living there and you're still paying rent your payments would just automatically go towards the government or who you know loan shark or whatever i don't know like whoever owns that that property at that time now you still live there and your payments just go to them automatically you don't have to go through any legal mess of you know paperwork and hiring a lawyer and all this all this nonsense cuz all that stuff can potentially be executed now on the blockchain instead yeah but see now this I want to talk about this. This is where I kind of run into a problem with these uh, with these DACs, uh, decentralized autonomous corporations, or it's, uh, in some instances they're commun called communities instead of corporate corporations or organizations. Okay. Okay. So it's a, it's a really great way to uh, maintain society. It's a really great way to replace to have a peaceful alternative to government because all go because really all government is is it's a social contract that everybody agrees to. And so inherently wrong with the government, just what has historically always happened is that the social contract has become unimportant, unimportant and uh, you know this government is this huge monopoly that has no competition. But these, um, these DACs, 
you know, it, it could change all that. Yeah. Because uh, it, it would make it would make the contract completely trustless. Um, you you know you I I wouldn't have to trust the government to uphold its end of the bargain, and the government wouldn't have to trust me to pay my taxes every year. You know, like like if I if I don't pay my taxes if I don't pay my uh, taxes to the water company or the portion of government that controls the water, I don't get water. Mm-hmm. If I send my money to the water company and they don't turn my and they turn or they don't give me water, uh, well then the transaction isn't completed. Then I, and I get my money back from escrow. It's completely trustless. But on the business side of things, like operating an actual company, I don't think it would make the company like the companies. It wouldn't actually make them decentralized and autonomous. I think it would just make them. Uh, I think it would just streamline the corporation structure. Oh, yeah. Well, that's definitely going to happen too. That's a, that's a huge component of it. It's going to you know, re- reduce the need for human beings to do some of these tasks, and that'll save costs. If you can tell Ethereum to handle your um, your your payments and expenses and handling property contracts and stuff like that, then there's no need to hire a lawyer for your business if you don't if you don't want one, if you want to save the money there. No need to hire compliance officers and other kind of redundant jobs that'll get obsolete if Ethereum and other platforms like it, you know, get mature enough. And then the the, the person who, who controls that particular organization or corporation or whatever would see a greater profit because they're saving more money than if if they had to pay all these random people before. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's completely true. There's going to be yeah. greater profit for them. Well, I, th- I think what a lot of people have in mind, though, uh, with these decentralized autonomous corporations is that you know there would there would like the entire corporation would be decentralized there would no longer be a hierarchical structure and that's where I would have to disagree with it because I was reading a little bit into these DACs and how they would operate um, like in because I think of everything you know in terms of economics so I was like well, like how how this work economically and um, what I read on some like wiki page about DACs is that um, the actual corporation would act like a normal corporation, um, but it wouldn't be controlled by anybody who would be acting as an entrepreneur. The entrepreneurs would actually be the developers, the people who coded the corporation. Mm. And so and so, what it would do is it would change it to where the, the entrepreneurs would have a vision and they would be able to take advantage of it and build something that contributed to society, but they wouldn't become like, filthy rich and so powerful that they can, you know, oppress everybody, for lack of a better word. It's not what actually happens on a free market. But let's just assume it does, and the DAX would solve that. But, you know, that wouldn't really happen because there would still be majorities because, um, you know, there would still be shareholders. It would just be, you would just buy shares on a decentralized platform. And so, you know, it's totally conceivable that some people could have a majority and then they would be in charge like they would decide where the business went mm-hmm. so you know like in my opinion there's just no way to actually eliminate like the entrepreneurial aspect of a corporation like there's like there is always going to be somebody who owns a majority and who and that person will always decide what to do right with that company's capital yeah, and I think that, you know, these decentralized autonomous organizations, it'll enable people to kind of choose between what kind of system they want to have for their business or organization or whatever. Like the person who develop it develops it, they can choose to keep a tighter, you know, tighter control over it if they want to, or they can just set it out there and, and have it, you know, be on its own kind of the same way satoshi just set out bitcoin and just everyone right. just does it well i think i think that's the idea right like every, like this is part of the open source movement you know everything is you know free information and it's all decentralized yeah but i i mean i'm i'm not totally versed on how ethereum would work uh building entire decentralized autonomous autonomous organizations but i'm sure that like the entrepreneur who initially designs it or the developer or whatever who makes this uh, DAC, if you want to call it that, um, they can code it in there somehow where they, you know, they funnel themselves a little bit of the of the profits that this that this corporate corporation develops on its own 
and it funnels it back to them in the in the form of you know dividends or or profits or whatever so like it's not like these entrepreneurs slash developers won't have any way to like collect money from their project they can just code that in there in there from themselves and um actually a great example of that specifically is um this new design for a dark market that came out a couple weeks ago um that initially i thought it was open bazaar but it's an entirely new project that someone designed um to act like open bazaar but basically whoever designed it um they made it so that every transaction you know funnels a little a little bit back to the developer and like some people on reddit were like oh wow, this guy's gonna make a bunch of money off of this he's trying he's trying to be the new the new dpr the, the new centralized uh market for 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 illicit goods but you know developers have the freedom to do that and they're they're always going to have the freedom to do that if they make something they can choose to funnel some money back to them but the the difference is now that everyone knows that they're trying to do that everyone can see that they're doing that um no one really wants to use closed source software anymore um so if you put out something open source out there that funnels you profit back back to you um, people are going to know about it, and people can still choose to use it if they want to. But uh, yeah, it's you can still do that if if you want to in, in the new economy. Right. Well, my my point is that uh, this uh, is totally capable of creating um, an entirely decentralized society where a free market can arise and operate without like you know any kind of hindrance at all. But in terms of the single firms, like, you know, for example, like a Walmart or, you know, some huge corporation, like the actual businesses themselves, I don't think could ever be, um, like decentralized entirely to where, to where everybody has an equal share of the company. Um, cause you know, as long as you can oh, buy yeah. a share, yeah. as long as you can buy a share, there's going to be majority shareholders and those are going to be the people who... Um, make the final decision and where the company is going. So while you know, if, while and you know, this is just my opinion, and I'm like far from an Ethereum expert. I don't think anybody's really an expert on Ethereum at this point. Yeah, except Vitalik. But um, but just from what I can see, um, just from like an economic viewpoint, like it's totally it's totally conceivable to have a decentralized society. Um, but I don't think I don't think that individual firms. Uh, would ever be able to profitably uh, operate without without an entrepreneur at the head making the final decision on everything. So what do you think about um, some of these theories that people have come up with for decentralized autonomous um, like rideshare programs? Um, you know, taxis are becoming obsolete as services like Uber and Lyft uh, get more popular. Um, so people are imagining like a decentralized way to achieve that where, you know, sometime down the future, this car can come pick you up and take you to wherever you need to go and it will charge your account automatically. And the craziest thing is there's no driver in the car. It's driverless. It's just a machine that's operating according to code and, you know, it can automatically find the fastest route to take or, you know, that uses the, the least gas or whatever. And, um, like that's, if if they code it right, this car can just you know operate on its own. This this fleet of cars can all just you know collect money from people for driving them places, and like I don't I don't know where the money would go. Obviously, it would go to pay for you know maintenance on the cars or the machines or whatever, and paying for gas and fuel. But um, you know besides that, whoever designs that system and does it successfully uh, will probably make a lot of a lot of money off it. But the thing is. Like it just it decentralized organizations just eliminate the need for um, humans to do certain jobs. Uh, you don't need humans doing accounting. You don't need humans, you know, looking at laws and doing compliance and stuff. So that means that you're going to have more human resources to to accomplish other things, innovating the company. Um, you know, that's that's one possibility. Right, that would and that would be a really effective way to efficiently operate um, a monopoly, and not and mm. not in the negative sense of the term. You know, there's this, a lot of you know negative connotations around the word monopoly, 
but there are some instances where certain industries, such as public transportation, um, they're they're just prone to monopoly because there's just a lack of physical space. Like, like there's there's literally not enough space for competition. And um, you know, on this thing I was reading about about DAX, that's actually you know one of its biggest uh, virtues is that um, is that it can it can efficiently operate a natural monopoly. So like so things like you know public utilities can be done completely decentralized. Um, like public transportation, like, you know, like, can you, like, can you imagine uh, if there, if there were, like, a hundred different uh, taxi companies in a city, like, competing with each other? It's not, it's not really possible because, you know, the roads can only fit so many cars. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, yeah. so the, the, there will just tend to be, you know, like, like one one company providing public transportation. Yeah, but then also that that also gets caused partially by the by regulations. You know, the the main one or two taxi companies, you know, uh, get in talks with the legislators in the area and you know, uh, fill out regulations that benefit them because they're like we already do this stuff to, you know, for our business. So everyone else who wants to get in this industry should also try and do them. And and you know, monopolies don't just happen because of a lack of space. It happens because of government assistance in a lot of cases. Well, yeah, the the, ta- the current taxi monopolies are like are totally created by government. Uh, but also, you know, if you notice these these ta- these taxi companies that are that have monopolies on major cities, they're you know they're also lobbying to ban Lyft and Uber. Yeah, yeah. Because because there's just there's not enough room for both of them. And, and they feel and, like know, Uber is cutting corners in terms of regulations that they hold themselves to. Yeah, th- and the reason the reason why uh, these taxi companies are so uh, reluctant to embrace this uh, this peer to peer ride sharing uh, structure is that uh, they have so much invested in the old systems, you know. Because uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that when something new comes along, you can't just immediately adopt it you have to actually pay to get rid of everything you've already built and then you have to pay again to replace it all with the new technology mm. and and that's and that's why old technologies operate you know like for for several years until the new thing takes over yeah even when they're and, still when they're already obsolete they keep going yeah because it costs too much to replace it uh, you know so so what's happening with the, you know the traditional taxi monopolies versus Uber and Lyft is that uh is that they these tax companies probably can't profitably compete with them because in order to do that they would have to adopt that technology which would require them uh to basically get rid of, a lot of their money taxis. To, they would have to spend a lot of money to overhaul their entire company. So so that's not that's not really a question of, you know, natural monopoly. Like once once Uber and Lyft uh, take over, if they can survive all the government bans and stuff, once they take over, it'll probably remain Uber and Lyft, you know, just because they'll become so popular uh, that they'll just fill up all the physical space, and it'll be hard to compete with them until something else comes along that makes it even more cost cost efficient with that. You know, I can, and I can't imagine that because Uber is Uber and Lyft. You know, the drivers provide their own cars. You know, like there's really not that much overhead. Yeah. So when we're so when we're talking about these DAX and in, in terms of uh, like markets and, and you know the economy at large, it, it's really great for natural monopolies because it it makes it makes them pretty much so costless. That they can operate efficiently, and then when something even more costless comes along, it, it's not that hard to break everything down and replace it. Mm. But in terms, but in areas where there's lots of competition, like food service industry, uh, clothes, books, stores, you know, any everything or anything where there's lots of competition, technology, um, you know, the 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 DAX could make them completely 
costless to a certain point, but you would still need that entrepreneurial edge at the head of the company to compete with everyone else because there's not just one company. There's a hundred companies. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it takes entrepreneurs to invent all this stuff anyway. Uh, so, and 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 let's let's be totally clear. Like all of these speculative, you know, ideas, it's, it's way down the road. If it's if it's even going to happen at all, you know, the, we're the only reason we are able to think up these ideas is because of recent in advancements in cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain technology. You know, just a few years ago, no one was talking about the the realistic possibilities of DAX. Now we all are because Ethereum is about to launch. Other decentralized systems are here. Bitcoin's been here for for a few years, and now we actually have the tools to try and imagine new ways of of building the economy, and um, you know, making it more efficient, basically. Um, okay, so uh, let's. That's that's a pretty good segue into um, or an all right segue into regulation talk. So let's talk about you know recent developments in Bitcoin regulation. Um, you you mentioned earlier or before we started the podcast about the European um, the European Commission they they want to regulate Bitcoin um, is so. They, they, they. What, what are some specific like proposals they have about Bitcoin? Are they taking their cues from New York? I certainly hope not, because um, um, that'd be that'd be terrible. No, I don't. From what I learned, there weren't specific proposals for regulation, but um, this. The European Commission's decision to uh, go after Bitcoin regulation, it, it comes shortly after, I think, like, not even a month, really, close to a month. Uh, the, Euro the European Banking Authority, you remember, they released their reports uh, saying that any financial institution in Europe is highly discouraged from using Bitcoin until there's a, a strong regulatory infrastructure built around it. Yeah. And... Um, and the European Commission has decided, you know, to act on the suggestion from the EBA and actually go after the regulations. And gotcha. while it's not while there's like no specifics yet, um, or from what I know, there's from everything I know, there's no specifics yet. But it it is going to be things like um, know your customer and any money laundering, things like that. So it, you know, it'll probably be similar to bit okay. license. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the governments are really starting to realize how how important it is for them to try and regulate this, or else they, you know, or else they totally get left in, left in the dust. They would rather try and co-opt it into their own system than let it, you know, thrive on its own and potentially overtake them a few years down the road. So they're trying to get out and uh, ahead of this and. Yeah, they're probably going to take the same approach as New York um, down the line. Um, but, you know, I, I, I talked with Eric Voorhees um, earlier this week in my interview with him about, you know, the impact of regulations and specifically the ones coming out of New York potentially. And, you know, we basically came to the conclusion that, you know, we should – as Bitcoin community members, we should try and engage with the regulators a little bit, try and get the laws changed to make them better when they actually come out. Um, but at, at the end of the day, there's a good chance they might not even make any changes to them, and the regulations will still be pretty damaging to the ecosystem. And But if that happens, people can just keep building their own businesses, their own programs, uh, their own tools for digital currency, and basically screw New York. Uh, we're just going to keep doing what we want. And there's ways for people to um, go around the regulations, whether you're outside of New York or inside. There are tons of technological ways to still do all the things you want to do relating to digital currency. Um, just you know, do it under the table if New York doesn't like the specific thing that you're doing for whatever reason. So, you know, yeah, yeah, I really think Eric 
hit the nail on the head there because he said he said you know we should be trying to communicate with these regulatory agencies um but we shouldn't be trying too hard because yes. you know because there's always a chance that we might make some progress uh, in in those legal channels but most likely not and at the end of the day it's all going to come down to developing ways to work around those restrictions instead of actually trying to change them and I think that, that you, this might be off topic, but I think that, you know, gives us a little bit of insight into where the Bitcoin Foundation is going, you know, because now they're all about talking to regulatory agencies and governments, and they're not really accomplishing anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think um, Eric definitely is spot on with saying that. Yeah, yeah, he has a great perspective, and and I think he's, um, he has a really good handle on the situation, and you know what the ecosystem, uh, can do, what it should do, uh, to fight regulations, um, but yeah, you you bring up a pretty good point about the Bitcoin Foundation, like these these guys have been you know trying to work with regulators since their inception, basically, um. You know that was that was kind of one of their points for existing like they collect all these you know f membership fees from the bitcoin businesses who want to join the foundation as silver members or, or whatever and then the foundation can use these funds to number one uh, kickstart bitcoin development which we haven't seen anything happen <laughs> on that front from the foundation so um and then and then number two like they can i don't know use that money to for as lobby lobbying efforts to to uh you know lobby politicians you know like a month ago they hired a brand new lobbying agency to to advocate on their behalf in washington dc so that costs a lot of money um but you know now we we actually see like you know regulations like on paper, proposed regulations coming from a uh, you know a state in the United States, the financial hub of the entire world, and they're horrible. <laughs> they're just <laughs> freaking terrible. Like it's 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 all bad. And then the Bitcoin Foundation sees it too, and and, and people in the foundation are like, wow, these these are pretty bad. We need to. This is you know it violates privacy. We, It'll we need kill to talk to New York State government about this. <laughs> yeah, like weren't they doing that already? Yeah. I don't. I no, no. I don't understand. I wish you know. May, maybe I'll try and contact, maybe a couple of foundation members and see if I can get them on the podcast to do an interview or something. Maybe try and explain to me and some in the community about you know like how how come the bit license regulations are so horrible when you know the foundation one of the main foundation's main goals is getting good regulations. So I I don't understand what happened there seems like a complete failure on their part and they yeah, they, so they actually did a recent rebranding of their of their entire like website you know redesigned it they have a new logo as well um and it 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 just seems like they're they're trying to save face for their for their most recent failure of getting pretty shitty regulations potentially on the books you know it's 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 ridiculous yeah it's just like it it if I could talk to somebody from the Bitcoin Foundation, I'd just be like, "No, you, you, it's you're not getting anything done. Like, help the community work around these regulations instead of tr trying to beg for mercy from the governments because you're not going to get it. Like, just uh huh, uh huh. You know, like actually do something worthwhile. And it's something else Eric said that. I thought was really interesting that I hadn't even thought of uh, was that if these if these proposed regulations become law, you know, not only would the Bitcoin economy in New York be really locked down, but New York could actually become you know a dead zone because yeah. not not only do these would these laws apply to businesses in New York, but if if there is a business outside of New York but has customers in New York, they basically then, have to comply. Then anyway. they have to follow those. They have to follow those regu re regulations. Like I'm, like that's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, if because because 
if you have a customer in New York who wants to buy even just like ten dollars worth of Bitcoin from your business, um, you know that's that's a that's a consumer, you know, by the government's definition, and that's somebody somebody that needs protection according to the perspective of the government. So yeah, that so business what, has to comply. So what Eric said about that was really interesting because, um, you know, he said that could like that could effectively turn New York into a Bitcoin dead zone because you would have these businesses who operate outside of New York but might have customers who live in New York that, and they want to buy something from that company but the company sees that they're from New York and you know they turn them away they say we're yeah. not going to do business with you because we can't afford to comply with all these regulations yep and and you know like like great job Bitcoin Foundation <laughs> like like you've done all these like government talks like all around the world with all these regulatory agencies and you know this is what it's accomplished like we've got bit license from New York and if it becomes law it could be you know it's going to be devastating potentially for the New York Bitcoin economy. Yeah, it'll be devastating for New York mainly. So like if you're one of those customers who lives in New York and you want to buy $10 worth of Bitcoin from Coinbase or you want to I don't know do whatever you want with Bitcoin um, those companies are just going to not allow anyone with an IP address from New York. They're not going to allow those people to use the service. So if you're living in New York, that sucks for you. <laughs> you can't participate in this brand new financial system that's been invented, you know, with the help of computer programmers and, and cryptography. Uh, you just won't be able to use it. The rest of us will basically be fine. We can keep using those services. It's it's just gonna be you know an extra hassle for those businesses to turn away those New York customers. They're gonna lose money from that too, and then New York specifically, they're they're not they're not gonna be able to participate at all. So yeah, that's I think the road that that, that, in, that we can go down if if those regulations pass. Yeah, I I think if this happens in New York, um, obviously there won't be any new exchanges. I think. What is that New York based exchange called? It's called ItBit, right? Yeah, ItBit is Something in New like York. Coin yeah, they're, they're is pretty also much in New York. And there's a couple like other things. Like the existing the existing uh businesses are, you know, pretty much already compliant cuz I'm sure they've kind of saw this coming for a while anyways. Right. You know, but you know, of course there's not going to like no new businesses are going to be able to come up and uh, um and like larger exchanges like Coinbase or Bits stamp or something who operate outside of New York but would have to be compliant if they have New York customers you know they're going to cut off their um, customer service and their service in general to New York so thing, I think things like uh, more decentralized routes of Bitcoin buying and selling like local Bitcoins are really going to take off mm. in New York um, but you know that's not really all that great either because that's gonna that would make it a lot harder to buy and sell bitcoin yeah yeah it'll it'll set the industry back by you know at, at least a year i think um in terms of just the maturity of the system and, and being able to it it, it, it kind of it, it centralizes it in in a way um not the overall system but just you know buying the buying and selling aspects if you want to use a major exchange which is license compliant or whatever so it it'll it'll set it'll set the ecosystem back a little bit, um, but yeah, we can we can we can get around it. It'll just slow it down. Uh, Bitcoin is still going to the moon eventually. It's just a matter of how fast and when we get there. Yeah. Well, and um, so it's still on topic, but we didn't we weren't planning to talk about this. But I just remembered this. Uh, I saw on Reddit some people were talking about these bit license. Uh, like the implications of it, and one person brought up you know, decentralized exchanges, and I, mm. a few that are out there, I didn't know they exist. And yeah, they're being built. If are, are they finished yeah, already? Some of them are, but um, like I don't actually know anything about them. This is just what I've read, um, in this Reddit discussion. Uh, I was like, somebody replied to this person who brought it up and said, "Yeah, they they exist. They're." You, he said, "Yeah, there's a few that exist, but um, but the exchange rates are really bad. Like, you know, they're mm. like a lot lower. The dollar value is a lot lower than on like a Coinbase or a Bitstamp. Mm. But I think that would be an interesting solution. 
because um, if it's decentralized, you know, you really can't regulate it. Yeah, it'd be impossible. Who are you gonna arrest? Who who gets yeah. the license? <laughs> ben Lasky, try and yeah, try and go and ar arrest uh, a decentralized exchange and see if you can find anyone. Yeah, and um, like, I don't know, I don't know how well that would work. I mean, you know, we just had this discussion about Ethereum and stuff, and how I don't think you could like fully decentralize every single business, every single firm, mm -hmm. but um. Things like, things like Open Bazaar and like decentralized uh, Bitcoin exchanges, like th those, those wouldn't really be like single companies. You know, those are just platforms. You know, like like on a decentralized right. Bitcoin exchange, you could have one buyer or seller who's more trustworthy than everyone else, and he gets the majority of the business on the decentralized exchange. And you know, but, but if he gets taken out you know, then there's still, the platform is still there. Like, they right. can't, they can't take down the platform that the people can trade on. And that, that would be really huge if it could be successful. It's like, it's, it's, it's like its own, it's like a piece of technology that can exist and operate on its own without the help of humans. You don't depend on them uh, for, for maintenance or whatever. Then it, you can take out all the sellers you want. You could even take out, you know, developers who are behind it and new developers could just replace them and keep working on the same code it's all it's all just code um <laughs> which you know when we look at it like that it's it's kind of like a free speech issue you can't ban code you can't ban speech so yeah you know they can't they, they shouldn't even try well that's actually cody wilson's argument behind this is really off topic but um this it's kind of like cody wilson's argument for um 3D printed guns. You know, he he said that he, this whole open source decentralized uh, crypto anarchy movement that it, it's it's combined gun rights and free speech together. So, mm. um, so now hmm. now that we can you know download a file off the internet and print a gun, um, essentially uploading that file would be like freedom of the press. So. Yeah, it's like so uploading now, a, a blueprint of something. Yeah, so now with with this advancement, like in technology that makes guns printable, you can't you can't fully ban guns without banning free speech. And so that, like uh -huh. that, kind of brings in a whole new wave of people who could support gun rights, like people who are anti-gun but they're, they're like really adamant about free speech. So like, what happens when if they start limiting the press? To ban guns, you know, the, then all maybe the anti-gun people will start supporting the pro-gun people, and somehow I doubt so that. that <laughs> well, if if it means preserving free speech, then you know, yeah, but the, they, 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 they come at to. they come at the gun issue from like a safety standpoint, like a public safety standpoint. They don't like people who are passionate about you know gun rights or or, or gun control. I should say more specifically, like they don't really give a damn about free speech. Like that's a totally like separate, um, you know, part of their mind where, where they, where they think about that issue. If they even care about free speech, like they're just like, Oh my God, all these shootings keep happening. We have to stop it somehow. Ban the guns. <laughs> you know, like it, there, there's no like free speech aspect that even comes into play in their reasoning at all. Well, I mean, when you combine the two, you like, you kind of have to pay attention to it. Don't you? Like, if like yeah, you you could justify it by saying, well, they're you know they're not really they're only limiting press to the extent that you know they can't talk about guns, but you're still limiting the press. Like I I know a lot of anti-gun people who still think people should be able to talk about and and should be able to talk about and so and you know advocate for gun rights just because they have a right to free speech. Uh -huh. And so, but I mean. To get back on topic, how this relates to Bitcoin exchanges is that, you know, somebody might be anti-Bitcoin and they might think it funds terrorism and drug use and all this, but if we, if it's like, if it's all code, like, how do you ban a, a line of numbers on the internet, especially if it's considered free speech? Like, you can be, you can be against Bitcoin, but you really can't advocate for banning it unless you have, like simultaneously advocate for restricting free speech. Yeah. So like this whole this whole like um 
like crypto movement, like open source decentralization, like Cody Wilson says, it it really um, he said it in context of gun rights, but really anything uh, that is affected by it, it it ties it together with free speech, and so it you know it it opens up a whole new source of support because even though they don't necessarily support what's being banned. Um, there, there would be a lot of people who would fight against the attempts to ban it simply because they would have to do so through restricting free speech. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a fascinating angle because y- you would basically get a whole bunch of people on your side who wouldn't have been there before, you know, just just to support free speech. If you can frame the argument that way, like y- y- banning this marketplace, you know, won't necessarily stop drug deals or assassinations or whatever all it's going to do is restrict the free speech of the developers who put this code out there to act on its own um then yeah i think i think that if you frame it that way most people would like really support it regardless of their other political views like yeah i think most people love what code and technology in general has done for society and when you realize that if it's it's all just numbers and, and letters in in a program um, that's, that's free speech in a way. Yeah. Like, like all the, like, just like, imagine if, if, you know, governments started, um, they started censoring the internet to get rid of Bitcoin. They shut down coin brief and coin desk, Bitcoin magazine, all these like news websites that who, um, you know, legally it is freedom of the press because, you know, we're, we're journalists basically. And so they start shutting down all these websites, um, and then they start breaking into people's houses, these developers, and, like, they arrest them and, like, destroy their computers because they were talking about something on an online forum and, like, yeah. writing a piece of code and, like, emailing it to somebody. Like, the, there would be people who wouldn't even know what Bitcoin was, and they would be against that simply because it would just be, like... The, like the government would be like grossly overstepping their bounds. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it'd be totally totalitarian, authoritarian, um, despotic, fascist. Could throw in a few other you know <laughs> buzzwords in there. <laughs> if they start breaking into people's Nazi. homes, Godwin's law. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Nazis, socialists. Um, <laughs> they're all those things, you know. But yeah, that'd be that'd be <laughs> that'd be pretty horrible if they if they started doing that. And you know, it, like. If if that scenario actually did happen, and they start busting in people's homes, arresting them, and you know, you know, s- destroying their hard drives and stuff, like at that point, it's not even really a free speech issue. That's just a that's a human rights issue. They can't they can't go in and 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 hurt people like that just because they didn't like what they posted on the global internet. Like like at at that point, that would just be a serious messed up power play by whoever is in power. And, um, you know, they're probably going to, you know, do other horrible things as well. So th- that'd be, that'd be good to yeah. uh, to fight on all fronts. Yeah. You, like, I, it's just really interesting how, you know, how code and everything we've been talking about, how the, the fact that it's linked, that it's linked to free speech is just really interesting because, you know, we, we can, we can make all these things bad things to it. Uh, with it, I mean, you know, but but at the end of the day, we're just exercising our free speech. You know, like mm-hmm. it, it'd be it would be like um, if somebody if somebody wrote a book and then somebody read the book and then took part of the text um, to and like used it to promote something like that was violent or wrong or something. Like, can you can you really punish the author of that book for exercising his right to free speech? And you you know you can't. And that's what that's what the whole coding uh, movement, or this whole like rise in coding technology does for things like Bitcoin. Yeah, but then you know, there's I just I just thought up another like side of the issue like you know could that argument also be applied to hacking attempts? You know where hackers are just using pieces of code or long pieces of code at that to to you know break into systems where they aren't authorized to access. And, you know, either, you know, steal money in the form of bitcoins or credit cards or whatever. Um, you know, would would the target data breach be considered, you know, uh, an, an act of free speech? 
if we start calling code is equal to speech you know like it, 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 speech can can have detrimental effects and hurt people yeah well now we're getting into like um is there a difference between code and what the code creates like mm. the hackers the target hackers you know they weren't using code necessarily they were using a tool that the code created and they used that tool to violate property rights like um you know it's it's like it's like um like what like what i just said like it's the difference between the code and what the code creates mm. Okay. Like, uh, like you can you can exercise your free speech in creating this, uh, in in writing the code and creating this tool, um, but then if you use that tool to violate somebody's property rights, that you know that's not free speech anymore. That's, you know, physically violating someone else's rights. Okay, gotcha. That's a good distinction to make, and and, and I guess you could also kind of apply that uh, reasoning to the, to the printed gun issue. Um, like the, the, the blueprint itself for the 3D printed gun and the gun itself arguably you know could be free speech stuff but if you use that gun to shoot someone then you're no longer exercising free speech rights you're yeah. just hurting people so that, that's, yeah, like, that's where it draws like a, the line a, a 3D printed gun like doesn't make it okay like it, it doesn't suddenly make it you know legal to murder somebody like here's the analogy i was just trying to think of when i had a brain fart just now it'd be like you know if if i wrote a book and like you know it was like a hardback book and it was like pretty thick and i took the book i threw it at somebody's head and gave them a concussion is it my fault for throwing the book or is it the word or, or is it the, the word's author's fault, fault for making up the book, book? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the question huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't don't throw books at people don't shoot people don't hack into <laughs> things you know um so yeah i guess that would be the distinction to 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 draw but the code itself the code itself code information should be free i i i try and adhere to that philosophy like um information should just always uh be free whether that's in the form of you know messages or you know articles or code that that runs marketplaces or whatever it is, it should all be free. It's just, the, I guess the the people who use that tool that is created by that code then have the responsibility to use it for good rather than evil. Yep, it's just like how, um, you know, there's still a level of responsibility and accountability uh, when people uh, like make speeches or something. Like code is just another language, like English is, except it's, you know, not what most people think of as a language, but that, mm. that's essentially what it is. It's a language for creating so, tools, basically, technological tools. Yeah, and like we can use we we can use the English language to create things like contracts and you know s these great stories and you know scientific theories uh, written down with English and things like that. Uh, but when we do you know bad things with with the English language, you know, we blame the person who committed the crime, not the language. And, uh, you know, there's kind of a disconnect between that with coding because a lot of people don't see coding as language. But, um, they you know, just in see my the tools opinion, and they see the results. Yeah. Yeah. In, in my opinion, you know, code is a language. So, it, you know, it should be protected by free speech and we shouldn't judge people based on. The fact that they use the language, but what they did with it. Man, fascinating discussion right here. You know, this, this discussions like this make me actually want to go out and learn how to code, so I can start creating tools that you know can change the world. You know, all these developments happening in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space, and you know what's coming down the line with Ethereum. You know, it's it's really empowers um, developers and coders alike into creating fascinating new tools that can change the world and you know maybe uh, maybe pretty soon i might i might try and learn uh, some some coding i almost i almost you know uh tried to learn cryptography over the summer and how all that works so i could understand like uh you know the the very basics of of what helps to make bitcoin reliable but um even that, like that, that's not going to, learning cryptography isn't going to help me build programs. I think I would rather learn how to program first and, and actually learn how to 
how to build these uh, these great tools that can change society. Yeah, I have no desire to mess with any of that stuff. Like, that's just all way over my head. <laughs> yeah. But but you'll benefit, right? It's oh it's yeah, I'll I'll definitely take advantage of it. Yeah. So you know, you guys go ahead and do all your coding and stuff. Cool. I'll, I'll pay you for it. Awesome, Evan. I'm I'm gl I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I I have my first potential customer in my crappy new program that I might build sometime in the future. <laughs> I will I will donate one Satoshi to your lighthouse campaign. Oh, whoa, whoa. Don't even bother then. Don't that's not even gonna cover the transaction fee. <laughs> See if I offer to my services to you again. <laughs> one Satoshi. All right. Um you know, I think that that pretty much covers it for this week's episode of the podcast. I pretty uh, delved into some pretty deep discussion about decentralization. Um, as we sometimes do, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, so, is there anything else you wanted to add before we close this out? Uh, subscribe. Hell yeah. If you guys like this, subscribe. Um, uh, I, in editing, I'm going to put our, our Twitter names down here so people can also follow us on Twitter. Um, follow at CoinBrief on Twitter. Uh, check out CoinBrief.net, the website. Um, links are in the, in, the, in the description of the YouTube video as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll uh, see you guys next week. I'm Sean. I'm Evan. And uh, Bitcoin on, everybody. Keep building the ecosystem. Full speed ahead. Catch you guys next week.